fantastic first day at uh, the conference, and great to see you all, great to have you with us. I'm sorry I'm turning my back to some of you. Um, Your Excellency, President Ruto, fantastic to see you again. Last time we saw each other was in June in Nairobi, and we were talking about development and the need um, to focus on growth. But intertwined in that has always been the climate agenda. For those of you that don't know, Kenya's energy profile, your energy portfolio, um, is 90% from renewable energy, including geothermal. You're doing things that many African countries would wish to do, but it is important to note, and we need to hear the data. Africa is only receiving 2% of global investments for renewable in, uh, energy projects, which is minuscule in terms of the energy needs. I want you to give me a breakdown in terms of why we have not seen money flowing into the continent and how you're hoping that's going to change going forward. Thank you very much, Elena. And um, it's true, the last time we were in Nairobi, we were having a conversation that included how we see the new world and how Africa is going to be pivotal in how we take the next steps. And as you have said correctly, Africa has 30% of renewable, um, of our natural uh, mineral resources, 40% of renewable energy. We have 60% of all arable uncultivated land, and we have the highest resources of um, uh, uh, carbon sinks. Now, we have challenges with uh, investment, as you've said correctly. We got only $60 billion of investment in renewable energy out of a $3 trillion uh, enterprise uh, globally. And two things, uh, maybe three, uh, come into play. Number one is the erroneous assessment that Africa is risky. And our risk, the credit rating agencies have put Africa at a phenomenal level of risk, which is exaggerated. That's number one. Number two is that um, to be able to access capital for development with that um, assessment of risk make, means that if you go to the market, you get five times, yeah. if you're lucky, six times. Maybe seven times. But this is the thing. The but but this unbackable and, and finally, project, this whole thing of Africa not having bankable projects, has been an age-old issue. And the, the fact that you know, the perceptions of risk are still too high, but that doesn't coincide with the climate emergency that's playing out. There is a disconnect. The money needs to now flow in. The commitments that everyone's flowing around and saying, look, we're committing, is not becoming reality, but we're running out of time. So how do we convince the guys with the money to come to Africa and not be unreasonable about the, the returns that they're expecting. It is the reason why, for example, we had the Africa Climate Summit, so that we can profile the assets that the continent has, whether it is mineral assets, whether it's our renewable uh, energy assets, whether it's our carbon sinks, whether it's our human capital. 40% of the world's workforce by 2100 will be living in Africa. 25% of the world population and market will be in Africa by 2050. And therefore, any development, any investment that doesn't bring Africa into the equation is deficient. Yeah. And therefore, the reason why we had the Africa Climate Summit, the first ever, is because we realized that we are in this space, nobody knows what the assets are in Africa, we have all this negative profile, Africa is a risky continent, it's a continent of conflict, it's a continent of this. But we are re-engineering the profile of Africa so that people can see Africa for what it is. Yeah. The continent of opportunity, where we have a young median age of 19, innovative, creative, hardworking, educated. In Kenya, for example, I spent $5 billion this year in the education of our, of our young people from, un, from primary school to university. We have tremendous resources in Africa. The world would do itself a favor by tapping into these assets and driving positive growth. 
using the renewable energy assets that we have, using our own minerals uh, that we have, and using our human capital that is ready, creative, and innovative. And so well said. Uh, I mean, the human capital element and the resource, that is Africa's true um, gem. Look, whether we like it or not, whether anyone in this room likes it or not, Africa is going to industrialize. Africa is on an aggressive path of industrialization. And that means processing commodities that we normally export. It means a bigger automotive sector. That means bigger carbon emissions because we need more energy for it. And, and no matter which way you look at this equation, Africa has been finding oil and gas reserves and many countries are ready to extract. Because if the, if the issue of energy security is not solved, we're going to default to perhaps some of the mistakes that have been made before. Kenya has found oil and gas, 2008. We were hoping to see those extracted in the next few years. What is the balance here between reaching climate goals, but clearly also reaching developmental goals with the resources that Africa has, and not just the renewable ones? Let me tell you that there is a wrong perception that renewable energy and economic development cannot go together. You know, that, that's a wrong perception. My position, and Kenya is an example, you know, when I tell people 92% of our grid is renewable, people don't believe it. But that's what it is. It is possible to drive economic to growth. Back, it is way. possible to drive <laughs> economic growth using renewable energy. In fact, it is the only plausible, it is the only mechanism that, will, that is in harmony with our planet. Okay, so Mr. President, and sorry to interrupt. Does that mean you're not going to extract oil and gas? Are you going to put that project aside? Mm, we haven't put as much emphasis because we believe that there is opportunity in renewable energy. We have geothermal resources, mm -hmm. 10, uh, 10 gigawatts of re geothermal resources. We have exploited only one gigawatt. We have huge opportunity. We have huge opportunity in wind. We have huge opportunity in solar. Tell me, why would I invest in energy that damages the only home I have when I have an opportunity to exploit energy that is harmony and that can drive the development that I'm looking for. So does that mean you're putting aside the oil and gas prospects? We have oil and earth gas projects in Kenya, but that's not my focus. We are focused focus. on renewable energy. We are having a conversation about, with FFI. We're looking at ammonia. We're looking, I've heard my friends discuss hydrogen. Yeah. We're looking at opportunities in hydrogen ammonia. We're looking at opportunities in e-mobility. That is the trajectory. And I would like to persuade those who do not believe the way we do that in the Africa Climate Summit, we made a clear decision that we are going to pursue climate positive growth, and yeah. that is the future. And we believe that it is possible to drive economic growth and at the same time be in harmony with climate by making sure that we use our huge resources in renewable energy. So Africa is disproportionately affected by climate change. I know that Kenya has experienced debilitating droughts. Um, and East Africa in general as well. Africa is also disproportionately affected by um, uh, energy poverty as well. And we're talking about development versus energy security. This has been an ongoing conversation. How confident are you that the loss and damage fund that was agreed upon is actually going to come to fruition? And are you hoping for some kind of mechanism on carbon credits? As part of the conversation we had at the Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, we agreed on a couple of things as part of our path to um, climate positive uh, growth. Number one is, of course, the huge opportunity in, in carbon credits and carbon markets. And our push will be to create standards and integrity around carbon credits so that we avoid the race to the bottom, that you know, we, we get standards, we get real value of what it is that carbon credits are worth, and that we do not, we avoid a situation where the prices come down because of 
um, standards that are lacking. That's number one. We also agreed that we are going to push the global community for them to look at eliminating barriers on low emission products and services coming out of Africa and making sure that we have a fair and equitable market that gives products and services, low emission products and services from Africa, a fair opportunity into markets globally. And thirdly, we also agreed that um, capital, you know, how do we work with the credit rating agencies that do not have sufficient information? How do we create more concessional funding so that we can unlock the potential of our renewable energy assets? I was happy to listen to Ajay Banker of World Bank today, and I sympathize with him. I sympathize with Kristalina. They are undercapitalized. They cannot give us the concessionary resources that we require to unlock our potential. And that is why we need a reform of the international financial architecture to remove the unfair rating of Africa as risky, to give World Bank, IMF, and other multilaterals the kind of capital that would give them opportunity to give concessional funding to us so that we can unlock this potential and to eliminate the unfairness that today we go to markets and we pay five, six, seven times more than others. I think that that's really... It's such an important point. And I actually spoke to the World Bank president earlier and he was actually speaking your praises in terms of what Kenya has been able to achieve. But because I, I've spoken to so many people and, uh, across the continent, we know that we need to industrialize in Africa. That's, that's no question. But can we industrialize cleanly? And the other conversation that comes up, whether I go to Zanzibar, Tanzania, whether I go to Seychelles, or any countries that have prospects for oil and gas fines, they say, Lenny, it's about survival here. You know, we have a right to extract if they're not investing in clean resources and energy. And that there's a sense of hypocrisy. If there's no real decision and, and sort of headway made by COP28, what do you think African leaders should be doing? You know, um, with what I see, Renewable energy is 75% cheaper than the alternative. Yeah. We can give supply energy to the 600 million Africans who do not have it. 30% cheaper if we focus on renewable energy. The challenge we have at the moment is that you need 40% more to invest initially. And that is what becomes an impediment. And then number two, we have the challenge of what I told you, concessionary resources that are not available. And number three, we have the challenge of um, uh, um, private money or markets that are rating Africa unfairly. So if we were to eliminate these challenges, it is perfectly the right choice to pursue our development using renewable energy. And we do not have to exploit the other resources because if we can do it with clean energy, explain to me why would we want to use energy that is not clean, energy that damages our climate, especially for us who are suffering the brunt of uh, climate change. Kenya, for example, we lost two and a half million heads of livestock. Yeah. In the Horn of Africa, we lost nothing. Nine and a half million heads of livestock between Kenya, Somalia, Djibouti, uh, Ethiopia. Do we really want to go there? No. Yeah. You know. So, so we must we must step up, and we must be candid with ourselves. It may look cheaper today to exploit uh, the other sources of energy, but at what cost? A huge cost um, for future generations, and the least. Um, we are in a climate emergency. Mr. President, um, there's lots of geopolitical tensions happening around the world, and we saw what impact that has on food prices, on fuel prices, whether it's a Russian war in Ukraine uh, affecting grain prices dramatically. It's causing inflation across the African continent and making things so unaffordable, and of course it, it creates a, a huge debt burden. We're also seeing on our doorstep here in the region, in Israel as well, how closely are you watching these events? Because when these events happen, it has a spillover economically, and it takes our eye off the ball 
in terms of achieving our climate goals? Well, um, COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, what's happening in Gaza and Israel, all these are really unfortunate situations, especially in a world where we are facing a climate catastrophe. And what has it done to us? Increase the prices of fertilizer, increase the prices of grain, cost of living is a challenge, and, and cost, you know, a ripple effect on what we already are facing, the effects of climate change. And therefore, we would do a lot well if we were, as human beings, be able to think about how do we resolve these issues? How do we deal with the challenges of conflict? I mean, and I, I, in, in the particular situation, I don't think there is any justification for any loss of life. For example, in Kenya, we have suffered the brunt of struggle for independence, the same way the Palestinians are doing. We have also suffered the challenge of terrorism, the same way Hamas visited terrorism on Israel. Both are wrong. We need to find a solution that doesn't, that respects human sanctity, sanctity of human life. And I think the sooner we get to a table and discuss these issues, we can never get a solution through the power or the, uh, the, the barrel of the gun. I think we need to resolve these issues because it's hurting us. It is hurting uh, those of us in the global south. Yeah. And the one thing I would want to say that the globe must listen to us is it is not possible anymore to do something at the corner and expect that it doesn't affect other parts of the world. Yeah. Just the same way, we have a huge demographic dividend in Africa. We have a big population of young people, learned, creative, innovative. Unless we have inclusive growth, either we invest in Renew, uh, um, in exploiting renewable assets that are in abundance in our continent, use it to grow, um, uh, to smelt bauxite, use it to add value to our iron ore, create jobs in our continent. You will never stop the wave of migration. It doesn't matter how high walls you build, yeah. it doesn't matter what regulations on immigration you put, it's an exercise in futility, we have a global village, we have one home we share, we better live together because this is what it is. Mr. President. And that I'm is why we have walked away a round of applause. from the North versus South issue because we have one world and Pre we need to realize that that's what it is. You have an important meeting you have to run to. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I could talk to you for longer. Your Excellency, President of Kenya, William Ruto, what a pleasure and honor to see you today. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency, the President. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. See you again. Thank you, Thank you so much, Your Excellency.